Apex senior officials meeting ends discussions. More data needed for gas's inventory plan. And lay families fighting to keep their homes. This is the National MTV News with Mary Bartulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Wednesday's news. APEC informal senior officials meeting ended today with discussions of policy priorities for APEC economies. Senior official meeting chair, Ambassador Ivan Pomalio, said the symposium on APEC 2018 that was held during the meeting had the informative sessions on the theme of harnessing inclusive opportunities and embracing the digital future. The informal senior official meeting is for senior officials from the 21 APEC nations to negotiate and decide what policy agenda will be discussed in lead-up meetings and at the APEC Leaders' Summit. A total of 137 delegates attended the ISOM meeting. Um, it is important just to uh, note that uh, the informal senior officials uh, meeting is a prerequisite meeting to the hosting of the 2018 uh, um, uh, hosting program. Uh, and it uh, entails um, senior officials discussing the key policy priorities that Papua New Guinea wishes to, to um, pursue in 2018. Ambassador Ivan Pomelio said that the meeting officially signs PNG hosting APEC 2018. The beginning of the work, but uh, I think uh, you need to just realize that it, we didn't just come yesterday and say, said that uh, these are the things we'd like to do in 2018. A lot of the economies, uh, the secretariat, our technical advisors have been part of this process of discussing and refining ideas and uh, for us to be able to come to this point and, and, and talk to the economies and say. With yesterday's discussion on key policy agenda, Ambassador Pomelio hoped the 21 APEC nations give their full endorsement. Uh, we are right in the middle of um, concluding discussions on the policy uh, theme and priority for, for Papua New Guinea's hosting year. Uh, we are encouraged by uh, very supportive comments that have come through from, from the delegations and we uh, anticipate that later this afternoon we will uh, get the full endorsement and support for the program and priorities that we are going to focus for next year. Executive Director of APEC Secretariat, Dr. Alan Bollard, said there is much work to be done in handing over and continuing from APEC Vietnam 2017 to PNG to continue policy discussions. That we've got a lot of work to be handed over to Papua New Guinea about inclusion, in the, the area of trade investment and regional economic integration and about digital and internet opportunities. And so Papua New Guinea, as you've heard, has decided to pick that up and run it as a major theme through a lot of their priorities. Dr. Bollard also added that PNG's preparation for APEC, while it is still ongoing, is impressive on both policy and cultural exposure of the country. PNG, of course, hasn't just come in now to start work. You've been working on it for years and for the last two years very intensively. And that's showing through both in terms of the priorities for the year that we're all hoping to see achieved. And secondly, organisationally, there will be a lot of meetings here and we're looking forward to hearing notional calendar from Papua New Guinea later in today. Uh, Papua New Guinea has also made a point of emphasising the cultural diversity of the country. Adelaide Sirix, Kari National, MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has invited leading business leaders attending a meeting in China to join other global leaders at the APEC 2018 CEO Summit in Port Mosby next year. O'Neill met with Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister and Vice Premier of China, Wang Yang, at the Fortune 500 Global Forum in Guangzhou, China, this morning. O'Neill also promoted that key elements of the APEC 2018 agenda. He gave assurances that logistics and security preparations are underway for PNG to receive the more than 15,000 delegates who will attend APEC next year. 
More effort is needed to collect the appropriate data from private and public agencies for Papua New Guinea to establish the Greenhouse Gas Inventory Plan. Today, the Office of Climate Change and Development and Japanese partner, Japanese International Corporation Agency, held an inception workshop to discuss ways to enhance institutional framework with technical expertise for a sustainable GHG system. According to organizers, the brains behind the project must understand the concept so a better GHG inventory plan is established. This is the third inception workshop to familiarize participants or agencies working together to create the greenhouse gas inventory plan for Papua New Guinea. With PNG experiencing a growth in the industrial sector, a wider approach is needed so agencies are all tuned. For JICA, this inception workshop is critical. So our goal is to help CCDA um, prepare a timeline, a time series of uh, emissions and removals uh, and try to make improvements to the inventory. The GHG inventory plan is part of the climate change policy CCDA hopes to implement for a better PNG. According to CCDA and JICA, a reliable data collection is vital for understanding GHG emissions and removal trends. And that information allows us to plan uh, and basically come up with policies uh, on what our priority actions are for climate change. So the greenhouse gas inventory uh, very much relies on data which lies with uh, other agencies, uh, the private sector, uh, maybe the provincial administrations. Technically, PNG lacks the know-how for a better policy to suit local context. JICA, who has been the helping end, will technically assist PNG build its capacity through proper surveys and data collection. And in February, we will hold a joint coordination committee to officially approve the work plan and uh, begin officially begin the implementation of the project. Participants today include SEPA, Agriculture Department, PNG Custom, PNG Forest, PNG Power Water, PNG, DPE and National Statistics Office. Follow-up workshops will continue to prepare PNG create a better GHG inventory plan. We have a role to play as a country uh, to be able to uh, you know, manage our greenhouse gas inventory because we all live in this one planet which uh, Moving into the future, we have to be very much based on managing our carbon content of the atmosphere. So. The move to establish the Greenhouse Gas Inventory Plan is part of the commitment by PNG government to implement the Paris Agreement. Jekla Pava Jr., National MTV News. Landowner issues on special agriculture business leases, also known as SABLs, continue. Now a group of landowners in West Sipic are convinced an oil palm company is not there to plant oil palm, but are logging over 100,000 hectares of forest. Portions of the land earmarked for oil palm are now deserted, deforested land. In this special report, Bewani landowners in Vanimo, West Sipic, talk about the concerns on the operations of Bewani Palm Oil Development Company. In 2009, Bewani Palm Oil Development Limited was granted a forest clearance authority by the Board of PNG Forest Authority to clear forests for an oil palm project. The area granted is 139,909 hectares, covering 12 wards in Vanimoto Aitape in the Sundown Province. BPODL also subleased the entire area of the land covered by the SABL to the landowners through the project agreement. The sublease was later sold by a Malaysian agent and facilitator to BPODL without their knowledge. Today the landowners can see an oil palm mill that hasn't been completed since 2010 and all their quilla trees logged and removed from their land and taken away on a ship with them unable to stop the illegal logging. So me, me concern. Or something blue blue, I me bagger up finish. Company bagger up him. No one blue blue benefit me like him. So me like him review. You must come up area. All the work only make him only bagger up one him. He come up. Me blue look him. Some blue blue look him that die. No cake me like him. Look look. 
If you are facing one the company where me talk to the Lord, pull him all the way. All the way, blow me come out. Now I'll say karma him. I'll say lose him. Now I'm a fight. I'll say I'm a police lawyer. With no roads, bridges, hospitals, schools and other incentives promised by PPODL to the landowners, their only hope is that the government intervenes and cancels the SABL. All by giving kind of excuse to me plan. Or me plan to him all, or straight him all. Walk, or some, or palm only die, now he must replenish him can, all by delaying walk. So me also on the proper ground now. Me also looking for some. It's like company. Me putting more interest them to log in, in all on plantation. Agreement only sign him on working oil palm plantation. Now blow them now company. Me putting more interest to log in. If like a looking, this now mill. Ah, palm suppose to go to mill now. All suppose to stop na background of ground. Waste finish. Me put proper ground suppose to get some money now. So, me walk long, look, look, long walk. Time me walk long, walk one time more. Me looking for some. The one who will plantation limited. Focus them, you know. Nothing too much long plantation work. That's an ablu ablu long line. Now that all greasy me look like duai. Like duai, that's all now. Me look like she's a fish too. All now walking more bridge. Bridge of the country. They're very healthy oil palm plants. Uh, palms in those two uh, plantations. Uh, they have a combined total of approximately 150,000 hectares. And that's a lot of money. And what it basically means is that uh, when they start bearing fruits, um, those oil palms are going to be processed uh, for export. So if they are exchanging it for log, I'm not too sure what, under what permits they are using uh, to do that. But if they are done illegally, then, then you know, it must stop immediately and that, uh, the, our authorities must basically look into it to see whether um, uh, they've done within the laws of this country or not. The landowners of Bewani hold the SABL is cancelled and deemed illegal. Lands Minister Justin Tachenko says SABLs are currently being reviewed by the Lands Department to see whether the leases are legal and following the laws and he is aware of the Bewani Palm Oil Limited Development Company's operation. Uh, we're, we're aware of, um, we're going through all SABLs as at the moment. For the last six weeks, the committee has uh, been uh, working on every individual SABL that's been awarded uh, to make sure that uh, all compliances are done and, and uh, all have been awarded correctly and properly. And I urge any landowners to uh, contact my office immediately if that's the case. We will not accept that sort of behaviour where their own personal greed is getting in front of our traditional landowners and our customary landowners and uh, their livelihoods. So for me, uh, the landowners and the customary landowners in these areas that are having problems have my full support. They need, we need to clearly identify who are the true owners of the land through proper uh, ILG um, identification and clarification. Meanwhile, the people of Bewani are still having ongoing disagreements with the company. A recent incident of a landowner, a Louis Yamip from Imbinis village, was shot by a police officer after a disagreement with the company on October 30th. He is currently still fighting for his life. Adelaide Xerox Kari National, MTV News. And Bewani Oil Palm Plantation Limited is yet to respond to an email sent to the company seeking their views on the allegations of illegal logging and the non-existence of oil palm production. Two years after the launch of the 95 million kina construction phase of the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone, the Madang-based project is yet to see any development. The 350 million kina project was set to change the fisheries industry in Papua New Guinea by generating 30,000 jobs. However, delays in the project have caused industry stakeholders to question if the project is merely a pipe dream. Lian Jarari reports from Manila, Philippines. 
At the launch of the project's 95 million Kina construction phase, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill stated that the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone in Medang would earn the country between 6 billion and 12 billion Kina a year once fully developed. The initial financial investment decision by the Exim Bank of China was stalled by the lengthy court battle with Medang environmental NGOs as well as pressing landowner issues delaying the construction. However, a review of government management and expenditure on the long-awaited project has revealed a 30 million kina expenditure, including a 4 million kina expenditure on the main gate alone, according to Trade, Commerce and Industry Minister Wera Mori. The lack of progress on the project has led skeptics to believe the project may never see the light of day. Well, if current policies continue, it's dead. Nothing's going to happen. But it's been a great dream. It's got great potential if it's done right. But nothing's being done right right now because no one is taking a long-term vision to say, let's enable the industry players to make a profit out of this. A profit on their rate of capital, on their risk, and the years they have to put up with at making a loss before they break into profit. You know, industry players are willing to take a long-term view if there's light at the end of the tunnel and certainty in the regulatory framework and certainty in the fiscal conditions they're going to work in. The National Fisheries Authority has admitted that the progress is slow, even seeing a transfer of the project between government agencies, first from the Department of Trade, Commerce and Industry, then to Kumul Holdings, and recently back to the Department of Trade, Commerce and Industry under the leadership of Minister Mori. I would not give you any update, but the idea of PMIZ is a good one. It basically uh, follows the, um, the desire by our Pacific leaders that they're looking for a hub in which um, Pacific Islands could use as a processing hub and, uh, and catapult from the overseas. Unfortunately, the progress on that is pretty slow under the Department of Commerce. Um, recently, it was shifted to um, Kumul Holdings and again shifted back to um, um, commerce and the progress, in fact, it's, it's, it's getting too long and the interest by small Pacific Island to come in is slowly eroding and we should seriously actually make it happen. Uh, now that the uh, more fishing will be done around the Pacific Islands because there's growing fleets, I think it's only important for us to move forward on that. Leon Girari, National MTV News, Manila. More than 15 families in Lay's Four Mile area are fighting for their homes after being forcefully evicted by the National Housing Corporation. This has been ongoing over a period of six years. According to some of the families affected, people claiming to be village magistrates are facilitating the sale of land without following the due process. Two of the families MTV News spoke to were forced off their blocks of land this year. This house was destroyed and everything on the property was cut down. Denny Paovi and his family have been living here for nine years. Last week, they were given a 24-hour eviction notice after this block of land was sold without his knowledge. The Paovis are one of the 15 families who have been forced out of their homes. Destroy Maria. Most of them have been awaiting land titles from the Department of Lands and Physical Planning, but have been given eviction notices from the National Housing Corporation. Jackson Gary is another resident who has been living in Four Mile for 27 years. He was falsely accused of a crime and was acquitted by the court. While he was held in prison for a month, the block was sold and his family was evicted. All Salim, all bias minus, only no inform was all by Salim block. So time only put him in the cell finish within seven days and all cut him down over and all symbiosis again. They are now living in tents and with relatives following the evictions. Removing me out of the block. And now I'm stopped, now I'm stopped, I'm about to street and I'm around with them. Chili won't have a family around stop. This is not the first property in the area to be sold without the owner's knowledge. Last month, the Boafax in Three Mile fell victim to this practice. 
They were forcefully evicted after their home of 40 years was sold. These residents are now calling on the Department of Lands and Physical Planning and the NHC to address this issue. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. Milford Haven Primary School in Leigh has only received 73,000 kina of tuition fee-free funds to operate this year. 89,000 kina is yet to be paid by the government. The school's head teacher, Mr. Yellow Amo, said teaching and learning has been difficult with rundown facilities. Leigh-based companies, including Islands Petroleum, yesterday presented facilities worth more than 53,000 kina to help the school. The school head teacher, Mr. Yellow Amu, who has been heading the school for three years, says the government's tuition fee-free policy has not worked well for the school. According to records, the government still owes the school 89,000 kina. The school has encountered difficulties. The school was not able to purchase new desks and chairs for the students to use. The government has been uh, preaching about uh, free education. Uh, TFF money, uh, we have seen on the newspapers and media that uh, uh, this kind of money has been budgeted for, but unfortunately they've been preaching. Uh, nothing has come forward to uh, bail the school out, and uh, those uh, TFF money that has been paid to the school, very low compared to the population of the school. Milford Haven Primary School was established in 1962. The school continued to operate with fees paid by parents. Islands Petroleum donated desks, chairs and sports equipment to a cost of more than 53,000 kina to the school yesterday. The donation was also supported by lay-based companies such as Tricer Transport and NCI Packaging Limited. This kind of thing should be bought by the government. Uh, company paid tax to the government. And they're paying the tax and they're buying things for us. It's really a shame, but I'd like to thank uh, Islands Petroleum for doing that. Islands Petroleum organized a charity color fund run in August this year to raise funds to support the school. The company manager for Lay, Mr. Shab Das, said such events are held as the company's community service throughout the country to help support hospitals and schools. We selected up and compound Milford Heaven School because uh, we are within that community and this was a good start in our own backyard. And the school itself, as you can see, is in a desperate condition situation. It needs a lot of help and uh, we really wanted to help the students and the teachers create a better environment so they could enhance their learning. Uh, Money is not going to fix that. There's no money as he keeps on reiterating. The government is, has very major um, budget constraints at the moment. So it means that there's partnerships like we've seen today with regards to Islands Petroleum, um, partnering with other communities, uh, leaders and also with other business houses and us doing it for ourselves. So the communities and, and corporates getting together and raising funds and helping where the need is helping. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Meanwhile, Education Minister Nick Kuman says the TFF funds for the final quarter will not be paid until the resumption of the 2018 academic year. Minister Kuman says 60 million kina will be rolled out next year because the 2017 academic year ends this week. And I'm going to do this for this year, for next year, because I'm all my school is now. You know, I'm going money now. It might go to the wrong hands, and I've been blamed for this. I want to make sure that I keep tip of those money. It will be in the, in the central bank uh, account. Uh, it will be quarantined until the school opens next year and the money will be available and they can pay all the outstanding bills that they incurred in the last three months. And Education Minister Nick Kuman speaks of the budget allocated to his ministry. That story and more after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. There is a slight increase in the 2018 national budget allocation for education. Education Minister Nick Kuman says they will continue to work hard for the delivery of quality education in the country. Minister Kuman thanked the national government for increasing their budget. 
The budgetary appropriation for the education sector has seen an increase of 8.8 percent. I received 2.9 billion, of which 1.7 billion goes in grants to the provinces, and 1.2 billion goes to the education sector, of which 800 million goes to uh, the general education, and the, um, the balance of that goes to. Uh, higher education and the, the development budget is almost 260 million kina that will cater for education reforms in the country and uh, most of those money is going to higher education that we want to uh, spend on particularly in the in the colleges and Tibet programs right throughout the country uh, to support us in our reform Meanwhile, a strategic change to improve quality and standards is to phase out the elementary school, which is part of the formal education system restructure. Also, we are addressing both uh, concurrently. So, the new structure is, con is as Mr. said, starting next year. I will not register any more new elementary school. Every school that starts will start with grade one and upwards. Under the new ward service improvement program, each MP will allocate 20 million kina for education capacity building. Our TFA program for the PrEP will continue to go to the uh, PrEP component. Fabian Hakalitz, National MTV News. The new Vice Minister for Education, Chris Nango, is a testament to the flexible open distance education of Ford, a pathway that enables young people pushed out by the formal system to succeed in life. In his recent ministerial appointment, it has given him the drive to work to improve the quality of education. Nangoi shared his story at the occasion to welcome him as Vice Minister for Education. Chris Nangoi is a first-time MP representing the people of Sumkara District in Medang Province, who was recently appointed to a ministerial portfolio as Education Vice Minister. His hunger for education led him to become a professional engineer and later a businessman. It was through the Ford system after being pushed out by the formal system in Great Tan. I'm from a broken family, you know, but you know, as life changes and things change, uh, this has shaped me and put me in a state where I really need to go uh, into higher education. So I failed in Great Tan. I fell in grade 10 and I went back to the village. I stayed in the village for four years. And through Ford, through matriculation, I made it through. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. Nangoi says his weakness gave him the strength and motivated him to help bridge the gaps of education quality. I graded with a bachelor's degree. And then uh, from there, I started going to engineering. I worked with diesel. And, uh, you know, these are the knowledge that I've gained and I started to become a businessman. So I went back, I established my business. And from there, I worked with the people. So the people mandated me to be. Uh, <coughs> I'll be working closely with you. Yeah. And we must see that we push the department to the next level. Yeah. Thank you very much. His official engagement as the vice minister will be on two agencies under the Education Ministry, the National Libraries and Archives, including UNESCO. I will report direct to on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, and I will only concentrate on the policy aspect of, uh, of the organization, so, which he can sign submissions, so I'll sign for him. <laughs> <laughs> Line agencies like the Teaching Service Commission today also presented the reports and five-year plans to the minister and his vice outlining reforms of strategic change. So how best we can we can manage and ensure that there is no vestige in the salaries and the entitlements of teachers. And we have taken that step and uh, we have produced the, uh, the, uh, uh, our own plan, TSC plan, for the first time. They have plans to work together for the better quality of education. Fabian Hacklitz, National MTV News. Addressing witchcraft and sorcery-related violence in Papua New Guinea will require all stakeholders' long-term commitment. 
but for any chance of success, work has to begin immediately. This was the agenda raised at the third meeting of the core committee for the National Action Plan Against Sorcery and Witchcraft-Related Violence, facilitated by the Department of Justice and Attorney General. Addressing sorcery-accused related violence should be a priority for all stakeholders. This was the message brought home at the third core meeting of the Sorcery National Action Plan in Port Moresby this week. The Department of Justice and Attorney General, together with stakeholders, have been discussing ways to deal with the ever-increasing instances of violence against people accused of sorcery. And according to DJAG Secretary Dr. Lawrence Colino, following recent incidents, work has to start now in dealing with this issue. We all depend on each other. Our job is to ensure that we uh, mobilize appropriate government support, civil society, international NGO support, and channel that through the committees, the provincial committees. So the provincial work is uh, really where it matters. Churches and non-government organizations have been identified as key stakeholders who government must work in partnership with. Let us not mix around with the other issues now on the end that you are providing in here. Let us base directly towards the sorcery issues on end. In the Southern Highlands province, incidents of sorcery accused related violence have been on the increase with Provincial Police Commander Joseph Tondop saying it is slowly adding to the general law and order issues within the province. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the manpower, we don't have the, the, the resources like vehicles to, and even to make it worse, some of the places where these offenses are being reported are even more remote, where police can't even get to these locations. The lack of a witness protection program has been highlighted as a major hindrance to prosecuting perpetrators of sorcery-related violence. Despite an increase in reporting instances of sorcery-related violence, actual prosecution continues to be a challenge for law enforcers. At the third core meeting of the Sorcery National Action Plan, participants were reminded of the lack of prosecution of perpetrators of violence against people accused of sorcery, in Enga province alone, there have been 31 attacks that have led to the death of 17 people. However, from these attacks, prosecution attempts have been futile. According to Superintendent Epinus Nili, who has been involved in trying to prosecute people involved in attacking those accused of sorcery, a major hindrance has been the unwillingness of community members to testify in court. Some people may love it, if it is okay, okay, good. So I mean, all right, all right. You're like giving me your options. How we will go about and uh, go inside and uh, penetrate that? Uh, get the witnesses to come and identify the witnesses, or identify the accused, and come and testify them in court. The experience in Enga province is one that is also similar to other parts of the country where sorcery accusation-related violence occurs. Given the situation, there have been calls to look at the possibility of a witness protection program for those willing to testify in court whilst it will be difficult, especially in PNG, where traditional family ties remain strong, it is an idea that may progress in the future. I'm actually uh, satisfied that the process is coming on well, but uh, this is just a start, and uh, hopefully by end of next year, we'll come back and say, see some stronger performance, uh, positive results. Um, let's not give our hope. I'm still waiting for the day that we are going to have a test conviction and sentence under 2298. From the third core meeting of SNAP, participants have agreed that the possibility of a witness protection program is one idea that needs to be given serious thought if prosecution against people committing violence against those accused of sorcery are to succeed. We all depend on each other. Our job is to ensure that we uh, mobilize appropriate government support civil society, international NGO support, and channel that through the committees, the provincial committees. So the provincial work is uh, really where it matters. Taking a look at the finance news now, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3115 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.304 US dollars, 0.396 Australian dollars, 0.2518 Euro, and 33.41 Japanese yen. 
looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee closed higher, gold is trading lower, cocoa and copper close the day lower. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil and copper close the day lower. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 109 points lower, the ASX is down 26 points, and the All Ordinaries is 27 points lower. National MTV News continues after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. The acting general manager for Newcrest Mining Business Support, Felix Tavil, says response to aircraft emergencies is one of Lihiro's material tasks. He says emergency response is an important mitigating control to reduce impacts. Regular training and drills are conducted to ensure employees are fit to handle any situation in the unlikely event of an emergency. The aircraft emergency response exercise was facilitated by Nikrist Mining in partnership with PNG Air. Volunteers and crew including medics, firefighters and international SOS went through the drills at Kunai Airport near Lihir. The training was on simulated fire and explosion, medical injuries and evacuations. It was a great opportunity to test emergency response capabilities of Newcrest and PNG Air, as well as contractors and supplies. The exercise was observed by independent reviewers who also provided feedback for improvement. In the meantime, real-time drills are conducted at every relevant site biannually with a desktop exercise on alternate years to ensure ground operation staff know the risk involved and how to respond. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. The alternative government has handed down its budget reply, accusing the ruling government of fake figures in the 2018 national budget. Shadow Minister for Treasury and Finance, Ian Ling Staki, delivered the opposition's address to Parliament yesterday, calling on the national government to be more responsible in the budgetary process. According to the opposition, there are three critical economic issues that require attention. A budget crisis, job and living standard crisis, and a foreign exchange crisis. In Parliament this week, the opposition presented its official budget response, outlining its thoughts on the government's money plan for 2018. Shadow Minister for Finance and Treasury, Ian Ling Staki, presented the alternative government's response, focusing on three critical issues, a budget crisis, job and living standard crisis, and a foreign exchange crisis. Mr Ling Staki claimed that the 14.7 billion kina budget had within it hidden and uncertain funding which was of a concern for the opposition. Even the 24 billion figure is hiding debt. We know are on the books of the Kumul Enterprises as well as other liabilities such as over 2 billion kina in outstanding superannuation liabilities. Over the last five years, it seems, the government has lost some of its way on serving the interests of the people of PNG. We need to get back to focus on PNG's people, our rural people, the often forgotten majority who have no access to clean, reticulated water, electricity, and privileged access to urban services. Like Whilst the opposition highlighted their concerns, they also acknowledged the need for both sides of parliament to work together to rebuild the economy of the country and offered to work together with government to make this happen. Among solutions put forward, the need for sourcing more friendly funding. And we should accept the need for friendly concessional finance. The budget hole is so deep, PNG can no longer get out on its own. We need to lower interest costs and bring in foreign exchange. Not expensive sovereign bonds. Credit Suez loans and tied unacceptable Chinese loans. Mr. Speaker, this government has got so used to living beyond its means. The Treasury is attempting to convince the nation that revenues are basically low, with contrary to the actual data in 2018 budget. 
Prime Minister Peter O'Neill defended the 2018 national budget, highlighting that it was a tough budget given the current tough economic situations. In the end, both sides of the House unanimously voted in favour of the 2018 national budget and the budget was passed just after 7 p.m. on Tuesday evening. You're watching National MTV News. Trukai Sports is up next. The Queen's Baton leaves Papua New Guinea and about 100 is the number of athletes PNG is planning to send to the Commonwealth Games in 2018. The details after these messages. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The Governor General says the Queen's baton relay strengthens Papua New Guinea's ties with the Commonwealth. Grand Chief Sebob Dadai was the bearer of the baton on its final tour in the country when he hosted a reception at Government House. The baton has completed its PNG tour and is now visiting Solomon Islands and other Pacific Island countries. As the sun descended upon the hill, the baton was carried by 2015 Pacific Games multiple gold medalist Nelson Stone, who then passed it on to Gao Tao, PNG's first Commonwealth gold medalist. She then handed it over to the last baton bearer, His Excellency Grand Chief Sir Bob Dedai. PNG Olympic Committee Secretary General Avita Rapila, on behalf of the PNG Commonwealth Association, said the Queen's Baton Relay is a powerful opportunity to connect communities with the Games. This is the fourth time the Queen's Baton Relay has visited Papua New Guinea, and each time our country has welcomed the baton with true Papua New Guinean hospitality and warmth. One of the important highlights of the 2018 Gold Coast Commonwealth Games is the equal number of medal presentation for both male and female athletes. It's the first time that has ever happened in history and we're very, very proud to be paving the way for gender equality as well. So I think that deserves a round of applause perhaps. Grand Chief Serbub Dedai presented his official remarks on sport and promoting of unity. He has been a proud member of the Commonwealth since gaining independence in 1975. And our involvement in the Commonwealth Games predates our independence as the territory of Papua New Guinea sent our team to the 1962 British Empire Commonwealth Games in Perth. The Governor General, who was invited to Gold Coast 2018, read the message from the Queen that was placed in the baton. Her message is a call to the Commonwealth to come together in friendly competition at the Games. The Queen's baton relay signifies a connected human commonwealth, a relay for the people, use, using real people and real stories. Everyone present took the opportunity to have photographs taken with the baton. Baton leaves Papua New Guinea for the Solomon Islands before it spends a week in Port Vila, Vanuatu, as part of the Pacific Mini Games 2017 and Vanuatu celebrations before continuing its journey around the Pacific. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. And Trukai Sports continues after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Turning overseas now, the International Olympic Committee has banned Russia from next year's Winter Olympics, describing the decision as the only one they could take. The IOC has also enforced harsher sanctions than it did for the Rio Games two years ago, after more damning evidence of Russia's state-sponsored doping was uncovered. For months, the IOC has been digesting the most damning information about Russia's doping crisis. Today, it acted though the delays in making decisions hasn't pleased New Zealand's former head of the World Anti-Doping Authority. It's taken them a long time to reach that, uh, and that's a pity. If the decision had been taken prior to Rio, it would have more bite. WADA wanted the IOC to ban Russia from the last summer games, but it opted against it, saying the decision was up to individual sports. 
but this time, after further investigation, the blanket ban has been imposed. Well, the New Zealand Olympic Committee fully supports the decision of the IOC. I think it was the only one they could take. There's overwhelming evidence that um, state-sponsored doping has taken place in Russia. It's been estimated 1,000 Russian athletes were involved in doping and that testing laboratories were also implicit. We have never seen any such manipulation and uh, cheating. At Pyeongchang next February, there'll be no Russian government officials, no Russian flag and no Russian anthem. But athletes will be able to compete as athletes from Russia if they can prove they are clean. You only get one shot every four years and the clean athletes that have nothing to do with it, um, for them to still have that opportunity is really important. Russia's response so far has included talk of boycotting the Games and also taking an appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And that ends Trukai Sports. When we come back, the weather details for Thursday. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. A look at the weather forecast now for the next 24 hours in the New Guinea Islands region. A few showers expected in Lorangao and Buka. Showers and thunderstorms for Kavian, Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe. Into the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. All these major centres can expect cloudy weather with morning fog. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. And that's the way it is. This Wednesday, the 6th of December 2017. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.